All right. I think um, we will probably have attendees continue to trickle in. I want to welcome uh, all the participants today. Uh, I'm Ellis Ming. I'm the VP elect of technical activities of the Engineering Medicine Biology Society of the IEEE. I'm based in uh, the US and California at the University of Southern California um, in the Department of Biomedical Engineering. If you're from this area, good evening to you. Um, we're very uh, excited to welcome you to our inaugural Distinguished Lecture uh, webinar series. This is a new initiative for 2021 in our technical activities portfolio. Um, and we'll be bringing in distinguished lecturers uh, through webinars to all EMB members all around the world. So please be on the lookout for future events. This is our very first of the series. Um, and to start off, what we're gonna be doing is featuring our recently graduated distinguished lecturers from 2020 who could not travel last year for the reasons we all know. And then we'll continue on and also feature our current as well as our newly selected class of distinguished lecturers. Um, so today's webinar and future webinars are going to be recorded. So if you missed any of this or you want to go back and look or share it with others, you'll have an opportunity to do so. Um, and then also uh, today or yesterday, depending on where you are in the world, um, it was International Women's Day. So happy International Women's Day. Um, it's, I think, fitting that our very first speaker of the series is Dr. Carmen Poon, who is from GMED IT. Um, Dr. Poon's an accomplished researcher and also co-founder of two spinoff companies. She's a longtime IEEE Engineering Medicine Biology volunteer. She served the community in multiple capacities, uh, journal editor, conference chair. She's chaired the technical community on wearable uh, biomedical sensors and systems. Uh, she's chaired the Biomedical Engineering Award Committee, and she's also won many awards for her work, um, including the 2018 EMB Academic Early Career Achievement Award for her contributions in endoscopic surgery and wearable sensors. Um, so before we begin, and I turn it over to Dr. Poon, I want to thank all of you who have submitted questions during the registration process. If you would like to ask a question during the live session, please submit that using the Q&A feature in your Zoom application. Uh, depending on your configuration, if you look down below, there should be a little button that says Q&A. Use that one instead of the chat. I will be monitoring that, uh, that for questions and be pulling some questions off of that. I'll also be pulling questions that were submitted during registration. Um, so you'll have an opportunity uh, there as well. So um, if we don't have enough time for some reason, I believe Dr. Poon's gonna be sharing her contact information if you wanna ask her uh, a question uh, or follow up with her after the talk. Um, and so with that aside, I would like to turn it over to our distinguished lecturer, Dr. Poon, who's gonna be talking about wearable uh, sensing and sensor networks for precision medicine. So Dr. Poon, the floor is yours. Thank you, Elias, for the uh, introduction. Um, it was actually originally based at Prince of Wales Hospital and affiliated with the Department of Surgery of the Chinese University of Hong Kong. So it and engaged them in research and at, at an early stage of their career. So as a distinguished lecturer of EMBS, I have the privilege to present our work and interact with different groups all over the world, both in person and also sometimes like now over the virtual platform. So in 2018, um, I received the Early Career Award from Nigel, who was then the president of EMBS. Okay. So EMBS is a very interesting community that helped build my career in various ways. So let me begin the talk by discussing what is precision medicine, okay? Um, obviously, it is much more than just N equals one, okay? Precision medicine aims to identify which approaches will be effective for which patients based on different factors. It says not only who you are matters, but also where you live, how you live your life, determines why you get a disease, what type of treatment you need, or even when do you need the treatment. Where 
herbals have a unique role in precision medicine because they can be used unobtrusively to capture transient events, which are often missed otherwise. Not only wearables can be used to track patients' health, doctors to analyze their own procedural factors, and these sometimes are related to treatment outcomes. By connecting different wearable, implantable, ingestible, injectable, and mobile sensors, physiology and behavior can be analyzed in novel ways, turned into actionable information, forming closed loop therapeutic systems. The advancements in wearable technology in the past decades were tremendous. The working principles for most of them remained almost the same as their conventional counterparts, with the exception of blood pressure measuring devices. Conventional cuff uh, blood pressure measuring devices were actually designed with an inflatable cuff. Clearly, this principle is not ideal when we want to use it as a wearable sensor. Therefore, we have been studying cuffless methods to measure blood pressure based on the wave equation. In fact, every time when your heart pumps, it generates a wave that travels along the artery. And how fast this pulse travels is dependent on your blood pressure. Therefore, if one can measure the transition time of the pulse, blood pressure can be estimated from it. To measure the pulse transit time, one can calculate the time interval of a pulse arriving at two different sites of the um, arterial tree. So this parameter um, sometimes is difficult to measure because it's a time interval that's actually really short. In, milliseconds range. So alternatively, um, people have been proposing to use the onset of the contraction of the heart as the starting point. This, some, this parameter is sometimes named pulse arrival time. Together with other features of the pulse wave, which are related to the properties of the vascular system, these are often used together to estimate blood pressure. Our early studies confirmed that if calibrated individually, pulse arrival time can be used to estimate blood pressure without a cuff. And the accuracy as shown in this graph as this light bar, okay, it's actually comparable to the cuff-based devices when the subjects were stable and calm and the, when the measurements were taken within a short period of time. Since pulse arrival time is confirmed to be a surrogate of blood pressure, we explored different applications of it. For example, peripheral artery disease is a common circulatory problem in which narrowed arteries reduce blood flow to the limbs. Peripheral artery disease is now commonly assessed by the ANCOCAL index, which is measured by a device that is designed with three to four inflatable cuffs. Each cuff measures blood pressure from one limb of the subject, and the blood pressure ratio between the ankle and the limbs were asked or were used to assess the presence and severity of arterial disease. Based on pulse arrival time, we have derived three vascular indexes. And these indexes can be estimated from a sensor network consisted of five sensor nodes. An ECG node, and four other photo or optical nodes that actually captures the pulse at the four limbs of the subject. 
when evaluated on subjects with and without peripheral artery disease, one of these indexes, the PAT ratio, demonstrated very good correlation with the ankle Brankow index, even when they were measured under different postures. This gives us very promising evidence that pulse arrival time indeed can be used in different settings, different applications for um, in replace of the cuff-based blood pressure with, uh, values. So far, I've discussed studies we completed when the subject is at rest and when blood pressure is relatively stable. What about when blood pressure varies? To answer the question, we measured blood pressure and pulse arrival time during maximal exercise stress tests. Each subjects were asked to perform a cycling tilt and the workload were increased by 25 watts every two minutes until the subject reached his or her target heart rate or exhaustion. So this is a very tough exercise and um, the subjects were around in their 60s, okay. And many, most of the time, we saw the subjects working very hard to achieve these um, targeted goals. During the exercise, blood pressure of each subject increased gradually and spans almost over 100 milliliters of mercury in most subjects. On the other hand, the trend of pulse arrival time is inversely related to systolic blood pressure and drops during exercise. Once the subject stops exercising, the blood pressure immediately returns back to the original levels, okay, immediately drops. While pulse transit time on the, oops, pulse, okay, did I drop it? Yeah, you're, you're not screen sharing anymore. Okay. Oh, interesting. I'm sorry. So we wait for Dr. Poon to, to get her screen back up. Um, for those of you who just joined, welcome. Um, I just wanna remind you all that if you would like to ask questions, feel free to post questions at any time in the Q&A window. That's usually located down below um, on your Zoom screen. Okay, so, um, so uh, during this uh, exercise, uh, uh, when the subjects okay, stop exercising, blood pressure immediately drops while pulse arrival time rises back towards the normal level. In fact, the trends are encouraging because they indicate blood pressure and pulse arrival time are actually strongly correlated with each other. Nevertheless, the situation is more complex than that. Because when we analyze the data carefully, the situation is a lot more complicated in the sense that when systolic blood pressure are plotted against pulse arrival time, there is a clear hysteresis phenomenon. So they are not linearly related. Interestingly enough, this hysteresis phenomenon is different for different patient groups. For healthy subjects, the hysteresis phenomenon is clearly more prominent, whereas for subjects who have been diagnosed with one or more cardiovascular diseases, the hysteresis phenomenon is, is less prominent. In fact, this is thought to be largely attributed to the complexity of the vascular system. The vessels is actually made up of many different layers of cells, and the mechanical properties can be controlled by electrical chemical signals. And during maximal stress tests, the vascular system has been pushed to its maximum limit. 
trying to adapt to the new environment. For healthy subjects, the vascular system is intact, okay, and therefore they can be ordered in order to adapt to the stress. On the other hand, um, for many cardiovascular patients, their system, vascular systems were not able to respond even when they were pressed hardly. So in order to further understand the vascular system, we use different machine learning methods to model the data. Using pulse arrival time and other uh, photo program features as inputs and beat to beat blood pressure as the task that the output. And in this table, you can see that most of the parametric methods can actually hardly describe the data in full. Only support factor machine and Gaussian process regression can describe the data to an accuracy that is complied with the criteria set out by American Association Medical Instrument Standard on evaluating blood pressure measuring devices. So this gives us new direction on exploring how blood pressure can be estimated more accurately without the cuff. We have also studied ambulatory blood pressure measurements. Using this pulse arrival time technology, we designed a cuffless armband, which can actually store data on the device, as well as transmitting the data to a smartphone for calculation. The subjects were asked to wear this armband on one arm and the cuff-based ambulatory blood pressure measurement device on the other arm. Each subject were asked to wear both devices for 24 hours. Data was simultaneously recording during the process. Okay. On the cuff-based devices, um, blood pressure were measured every 15 to 30 minutes and less frequently during nighttime because it's very interrupting to your sleep. On the other hand, pulse transit time um, based methods, cuffless measure, we can actually sample it a lot more frequently because it's, it's basically unobtrusive, okay? It doesn't interfere with the daily activities of the subject. Correlation between the cuff based and the cuffless devices were actually found to be high during nighttime particularly after smoothing and removing some transient data. Why we need to remove these transient data? This is because the transient data cannot be captured by the reference cuff-based devices. Therefore, it is inappropriate to compare the cuffless and the cuff-based devices during these periods. Furthermore, we study the effect of synchronization of the estimated and reference blood pressure measurement during this ambulatory monitoring. Um, over the 24 hour period, the cuffless and cuff-based devices are unlikely to be measured at the exact same time point. Therefore, if we interpolate and synchronize the data, actually the two devices agrees a lot better with each other. So if you compare the variation of blood pressure of each subject overnight with the variation of the estimated and the reference blood pressure of each subject, you can find that actually blood pressure varies overnight on each subject. And this variation is actually very similar to the difference between the cuffless and the cuff-based devices they are all the same order of magnitude. So this is very encouraging because we understand that indeed, okay, cuffless estimation can be used to represent a lot of the cuff-based blood pressure readings, and it can be used more comfortably and used continuously as the counterpart compared to cuff-based. So, Furthermore, if you find the absolute differences between the cuff and the cuffless readings, they are actually within the, the requirements of the uh, AMI standard. And this is very encouraging. Moving from a single wearable sensor to a greater scale, current clinical systems are often hospital-based and we relied on patients 
to seek consultation if they find it necessary. Nevertheless, there are health needs outside the hospital. And this is clearly proven, for example, during the, this pan COVID pandemic. And we cannot solve subjects on, the, uh, on, the, on people to seek consultation. We have to be proactive in many ways, especially in some diseases that actually have acute events. Linking mobile health with hospital is a trend that is happening and will continue to happen. And we definitely will see an increase in sensing devices for health, not only at home, but likely during transition period to the hospital and after a patient is discharged from the hospital. With the enormous amount of data, interpretation of them is no longer trivial. So let me use the situation in the critical care units to illustrate how artificial intelligence can bring about a paradigm change in future patient care. At present, SEPS2, the simplified acute physiological score, it's a traditional risk score used to predict hospital mortality of patients admitted to an ICU. Notice that the systolic blood pressure is one of the many parameters of SEPS2. Over a 24 hour period, different vital signs can be measured and the most the trend for each parameter were used to calculate the probability of hospital mortality of a patient. On the other hand, using a multitask deep network with attention mechanisms, we have showed that the prediction of mortality can be increased by as much as 10 to 13% compared with SAPS2 in terms of both sensitivity and precision. The deep network also tells us that if we do not weigh the data at each hour, measured at each hour equally, we have a better chance to pick up a, pre, a, a death case. As shown here, in this case, which the deep network can pick up, uh, predicts correctly that the patient is going to die in the hospital, but not other networks. And if you look at the weighting of each data, uh, piece of data recorded at each time, uh, time period, they actually weight those collected within six hours after admission, much more than those after six hours. So this is different from our intuition. When we think maybe towards the end, you will actually have better or more important, more valuable information, and that's not the case. Furthermore, the knowledge learned can also be used to guide the prediction of mortality in other patient groups especially when some of these patients groups have a percentage of mortality that was not as much as those found in the ICU. As shown in this right figure, direct computation using the inputs of a group of patients with acute upper GI bleeding and submit using the ICU deep network as the backbone, we can actually predict mortality much better than the traditional risk score, the Glasgow Blackford leading score, which is indicated by the blue line, okay? Especially in the high risk patients, the predictions are much more accurate using the deep network that learned knowledge from the ICU. Training on based on the AUGIB patients further can actually help to predict much better. And the data fits that best in this situation. So to conclude, okay, many diseases are heterogeneous and dynamics in nature. So wearable and mobile sensors in this situation are critical for capturing transient features, ambulatory information, and long hours of data on subjects. These are difficult to be accomplished by the conventional traditional devices, 
medical devices. Furthermore, knowledge learned from large scale studies, n equals infinity, okay, should be better utilized to predict clinical outcomes on individual cohorts. That's the one of the most important aspects in precision medicine. So for this, okay, I would like to thank many teammates, colleagues, um, collaborators, my students, and uh, my staff. So, okay, the works were actually done by many uh, people, not just me. Okay, and these works were mostly done when I was with Chinese U, uh, with the support from many colleagues. So I would like to particularly thank James, who have taught me a lot about medicine and surgery. Okay, and if you are, your eyes are sharp. Okay, I showed here one department photo we took in 2019, and you can find me in this photo. So thank you very much for your time. Most of the work that I presented today can be found online using this orchid ID. Okay, and if you have any questions, feel free to ask and contact me in the in future. Thanks. Well, great, thank you, Carmen, for your presentation. Um, I'm going to start off with a few questions that were posed by our registrants when they when they initially registered for the meeting, and then anyone else who's with us uh, live, feel free again to post any questions you have in the Q and A function. Uh, so let me let me start off with this um, some a couple of general questions here. So. You mentioned briefly in your talk that you had or you looked at characterizing sensors and trying to get them to meet the AAMI standards. Um, and I think that standard is really sort of broadly for maybe not a, a non-ambulatory wearable sensor. Are there any standards norms specifically made for wearable sensors or, or is that standard that you mentioned actually meant for wearable standards, uh, sensors? Um, this is a very good question. Uh, in fact, um, one of the standards uh, in measuring wearable cuffs, that's actually the first standard uh, for wearable device. It's on um, the cuffless blood pressure measuring devices that we actually put up through IEEE. Um, that's uh, through the IEEE standard committee, and that's uh, named P1708. Okay, and that standard, we actually tackled a lot of issues, including those that are. Uh, actually found more importantly in the wearable devices. For example, how you can um, calibrate, how you can compare it in ambulatory settings and all these. And actually that standard has gained um, a lot of attention, not only in the academic community, but also in the industry. And some uh, industrial partners, uh, industrial uh, 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 companies that are uh, Building wearable devices are using those as their evaluation methods. Okay, so that it's a long story. Okay, we can go on for hours. Okay, because it's uh, uh, a lot of hard work in, in in the modeling and the theoretical work on on wearables. But um, uh, that's another important uh, topic on uh, that uh, I triple support uh, in in wearable devices. Great. Um Wearables, I think, can be challenging, right? I think in your studies, there were short-term 24-hour study, at least one of the ones you mentioned. So one of the um, registrants wants to know, you know, do you have ways or strategies to engage patients to wear the wearables on a regular basis if you were trying to do a more chronic study? Yes, um, I believe uh, wearables, uh, when we did most of these studies, okay, wearables are less um, common uh, in the real world, okay. Uh, now I think it's getting more and more uh, widely accepted. by say Fitbit, the Mi Smart Smart Band, and all these. Um, I think one important aspect is you have to make it completely unobtrusive, okay, not affecting its daily activities. If you ask the subject to uh, purposefully measure this every day, especially several times a day, then I think they will drop out very easily, okay? But if it, all these sensors are incorporated in their daily activities, in their daily um, uh, gadgets, um, they don't need to remind themselves on measuring these uh, parameters 
then I think you have a much higher compliance. Um, that I think it's the ultimate goal of wearables. So there's a, a rather open-ended question uh, also posed by a registrant and they wanna know what the pros and cons of wearable sensors are in healthcare and precision medicine. And so do you want to take a moment to um, discuss that topic? Yes, um, pros, uh, actually I mentioned a lot, right? Because wearables, you can actually measure the transient features. Uh, you can use more often the, in the ambulatory settings, which actually in the past, okay, you don't have those information for the doctors, right? Um, cons, or I should, I should say not only cons, but uh, it's more about the challenge, okay? It's, um, I should also mention a little bit at towards the end of my talk. It's actually the amount of data in this settings are actually enormous, okay? And it's becoming difficult for uh, clinicians to interpret and draw any conclusions from them. Okay. So uh, I would likely think, uh, likely uh, we will see a lot of new artificial intelligence algorithms uh, to actually interpret those for the doctors. And that's not an easy task, okay? And especially many of the doctors nowadays, okay, they are not fully um, accepting algorithms results. Okay? They think, can I actually trust the computer, right? And that's a long way, okay? Because you have a lot of false positives, you have to demonstrate in many clinical trials that actually they can do better than you, um, in even under very complicated and complex situations, okay? So the roles between the clinicians and the computers will be very different in future, I would say, okay? As the more interactive and they have to understand the, the, the theory behind. So they are not only accepting them as a black box, but they actually can know what they can do, the, the, the computers can do what they cannot, and then it works more complementary. And by then, I think um, the, the, the advantages of using wearable sensors can be fully demonstrated. That's great. So I think you've watched um, the progress and technological development in this field for some time. And I'm kind of curious, what has you sort of most excited in, in more recent developments since you started out in this area? Okay. Um, the most excited and uh, uh, some of them, I, I, it's, I can't capture it all, okay. But in the past, okay, when I saw wearables, okay, it's more like a concept, okay. And in most cases, in most lab studies, um, they are actually not wearable devices, okay. They are just huge devices that build on the patient, on the subject, okay. And it's difficult to carry uh, those in your normal life, okay? Nowadays, we saw miniaturization of these devices, very niche, very rationable. And I think the, the communities are accepting that, okay? And in some of the um, situations, these devices can use not only in high resource settings, okay? Because they are reasonably affordable, and they can be used also in the low resource settings. And I think that helps in um, equalizing the healthcare systems where some uh, regions, they may not be able to afford those big um, infrastructures, uh, healthcare systems. They can still use this kind of high technologies to advance um, their healthcare in various ways. And that's, uh, I think, are uh, very exciting. Uh, yeah points of wearables. It's indeed a very exciting time. So I've got uh, several questions that are coming in uh, live from the audience. And so I think we'll start maybe here. Let, let's start with what's the physical principle that you're using for measuring the blood pressure pulse? Physical principles is actually the wave uh, uh, transmission. Um, so if you look at our artery system, it's actually not uh, uh, it's live tissues, so you cannot consider it as a, 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 a system that's it's, um, not responding. It's a, a nonlinear system that can adapt to many different environments. 
but the fundamentals as um, the, the mechanical properties of the arteries are actually related to blood pressure and that because of that okay uh, how fast your pulse travels can be estimated from uh, can used to estimate your blood pressure and that's the fundamental uh, theory behind the cuffless approach and that's completely different from the the cuff based devices great uh to follow up uh, there's a question about if you've explored monitoring other parameters like stroke volume um, from wearables along with the blood pressure uh, we did okay um, but um, we found that um, blood pressure it's more commonly used in many clinical other than stroke volumes and, and in fact i think they are all related okay and if you can actually model the cardiovascular system as a whole you know um, they are just different parameters, okay, that uh, are generated from the cardiovascular system. Um, but we focus on cardio uh, blood pressure uh, partly because um, it's uh, due to limited patients of manpower and resources, okay. Another is, as I said, this is actually commonly used in many settings. And um, uh, what I think uh, important, it's not only the cardiovascular systems. And if you look at what I presented at the very last part bit, okay. Um, in fact, not only the cardiovascular systems, uh, parameters from those uh, matters. Um, we actually need to broaden our view and look also into other um, uh, test uh, devices, such as those that captures the biochemical um, uh, properties uh, of the of the blood and, and all of these and and actually I think um, those actually are important future trends of wearables. Uh, great. So there's um, another sort of follow-up question from the uh, same individual. So what where particularly do you think ambulatory continuous blood pressure monitoring can be helpful from a consumer perspective? Um, at the present moment maybe not uh, complete continuous measurements uh, for all subjects, okay, but for designated uh, patient groups, especially those with, um, we know, uh, with, with high risk of uh, blood pressure changes, okay, um, and also those who are maybe uh, at high risk of sudden death, okay? Maybe we can begin with those patients um, and understand more uh, if where variables, continuous blood pressure or bits to bits blood pressure measurements can help those patients. I think that's a good start, okay? Um, in the, in, in, to begin with, I don't think we should measure blood pressure for everybody uh, continuously uh, in always, okay? Um, I don't think we have that resources and I don't think the resources should be allocated that way. So then for your sort of target patient population, where do you think the sensor should be located to do the continuous blood pressure measurement? Um, that's another good question. Okay, I think it very much depends on your application. Okay, so say for example, in peripheral artery disease, some of the sensor nodes have to be at the peripheral limbs. Um, but on the other hand, when we design the ambulatory armband, we actually put all the sensors on the arm. Um, that's because we eliminate some of the factors. Say, for example, we know there are hydrostatic effects in blood pressure. And if we want to have an accurate measurement, if the sensors are actually located at different uh, uh, heights or different body locations, we have to calibrate those as well. But on the other hand, if we send, put all the sensors on the armband, in that particular situation, okay, it helps simplify the design of the device and while ensuring that the measurement gives a good result. So um, that's no general uh, uh, answers to where should you put the sensors, okay? It very much depends on each application, I would say. All right, so I think we'll take two more questions and then we'll wrap it up. Um, 
How do you separate the blood flow induced compliance in arteries from adjoining tissues like muscles, uh, for example, which uh, becomes more prominent in areas with microcirculation? Hmm. Um, in fact, at the present moment, uh, we, uh, the, the model that I presented is actually based on pressure wave. So it's related to blood flow, but it, it, it's not entirely uh, modeled in the situation. Okay. So if you know waste theory, we know that flow, like voltage and current. Okay. So the, the, the pressure is like the voltage. The, flow it's actually like the current so that part uh, actually um it's a different parameter set at the present moment it's not taking account of and of course if you measured uh, and un understand flow i think in some situation for example if you have huge temperature change that actually your micro vessels will constrict while your uh, major vessels may not have that much response those situations, I think that has to be accounted of. Other than that, okay, I think um, we can keep the, the model simple. Um, and also in some situations, we can use uh, more complicated uh, machine learning algorithms to accomplish those, okay? And that by then you don't need to model each parameter, each physical parameters individually. Great, so final question, and I think you may have touched upon this a little bit. Um, the question is, how can we resolve a trade-off between optimizing the sensor position and getting accurate measurements? I think a trade-off, it's actually application dependent, okay? Um, as I stressed many times, okay, it's very, very difficult to design one universal medical device that serves all patients in all settings for all purposes. So blood pressure um, measurements uh, in the past has been considered as an individual parameter. But if you look at application, actually in most cases, we combine information in many different settings and fit in that particular scenario to generate results. So wearable sensors and sensor network in a sense, um, in this situation, means that we actually need to design more specific devices but um, generally they can give um, information for different patients in different applications um, that takes time okay and we need to search a little bit which is the best okay and and no definite answer right away so, so Carmen, thank you so much for sharing your wisdom and your career experience in this area and for agreeing to be the first speaker in our Distinguished Lecturers webinar series. Um, really appreciate all your service to EMB in the past and hope to see much more of you. So with that, I'd like to conclude our very first event. Uh, and again, thank you to our speaker as well as all the participants. Um, and we will be in touch again when the recorded video is ready uh, for you to review again. All right, well, thank you thank everyone. Thank you, thank you all, bye.